Our first story is all about an old home movie we found in an online archive. It was shot aboard a freighter on the Great Lakes, but that's all the information we have. I wanted to know who shot this film and when. What freighter are they on? And can we identify the places and people we see on the screen? But to figure that out, I needed help. So I called Roger Hewlett, director of the Great Lakes Lower Maritime Museum, Carrie Soden, archeological director at the National Museum of the Great Lakes, Joel Stone, senior curator at the Detroit Historical Society, marine historian Roger Lelever, and Michelle Briggs, chief park ranger at the Sioux Locks U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We watched the film and tried to do some research to solve the mystery. Michelle, what were your thoughts when you first saw the film? Like most of the boat nerds who watch these sorts of things, I start looking for clues to try to kind of unravel the mystery. I was curious who was behind the camera, and as I was watching the things they were filming, it seemed apparent that it was probably a guest on board. They were filming a lot of things that the crew and people who live and work aboard a freighter would have just considered mundane, everyday things and not really all that interesting. Judging by the angles and perspectives where the film is taken, um, this is probably a guest of the captain. These vessels, they were built with passenger cabins, not lots of them, but a few, and they were often given by the shipping company to people that were important to the shipping company. Taking a trip on a Great Lakes freighter for most people is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And frankly, you would wanna document every single minute of it. Well, in the first shots of the film, we see a freighter loading up with cargo. What do we know from what we see in the film? I can tell from watching the footage that this is an iron ore carrying vessel. It's a standard laker, which means it has a forward pilot house and then cabins at the uh, stern end as well. This is not a self unloading bulk carrier. So this is before the self unloading bulk carriers became the standard. Right, freighters built since the 50s have been self unloaders that use a conveyor belt on a boom to move cargo onto the shore. This boat doesn't have a boom arm, so it had to be unloaded some other way, and it was definitely built before the 1950s. Any idea where this dock is? That is in Duluth. That's a Duluth Harbor. If you look, the camera will pan up and you'll see the top of it. That's where rail cars actually go from the mine after the ore is crushed. And then those men that you see kind of clambering around up in there are called pin knockers. And they would pop a pin and those chutes would lower down and the cargo would rush into the ship just like it was a waterfall. My suspicion is that this is the uh, west side of the DM&I R ore dock number six. Oh yeah, the Duluth Masabi and Iron Range Railway ore dock number six in Duluth does look like the right spot. Here's a picture of another freighter loading at that dock. You can see the locomotive up on top of the dock, and those rail cars will be dumping their cargo down chutes into the cargo holds on the freighter. Here's the location shown in the film, and here's the dock in 3D from Google Earth. Sure looks like a match to me. Now, all this footage is taken on the freighter, so we never see the name of the ship. Roger, any idea what this boat is? I knew right away it was a vessel from the Great Lakes Steamship Company by the smokestack that black staff with what would have been a gold band if that were in a color photo. And the name that immediately popped to mind was the Smith Thompson of that fleet. So I compared the picture on video with other photos of the Smith Thompson. And uh, a lot of boxes were checked. Oh, wow. I'm looking at a picture of the Smith Thompson and that looks like the boat. The Smith Thompson was built in Toledo, Ohio in 1887. She was 438 feet long and could carry 4,700 tons of iron ore. Not a giant by today's standards. When you compare that to the 1,000 footers, some of those can carry almost 70,000 tons of taconite pellets, which is today's equivalent of uh, the raw iron ore. Well, after we see the freighter loading up in Duluth, the next thing we see is a place I recognize. It's the Sioux Locks on the St. Mary's River, which takes ships from Lake Superior down to Lake Huron. So the freighter has sailed across Lake Superior and it's heading south. 
Michelle, this is your territory. Tell me what you see in the film. The first thing that really noticeably comes into view is a hydropower plant that was built around 1906 at the upper end of the rapids. I'd also notice attached to that hydropower plant, there's an addition on the far left side. That is a building that is still at the Sioux Locks. It was added to that power plant in 1932, and we call it Unit 10. So because Unit 10 is there and its construction is finished, we know for sure that this footage could not have been before 1932. Okay, so we know where we are and we know it was after 1932. Any other clues? It doesn't seem to have a lot of a military presence. And there, were, there was a military presence beginning at the Sioux Locks in 1939. That's right. During World War II, they thought the Sioux Locks might be attacked. The locks were so strategic at that time that they put in uh, 50 anti-aircraft guns during the war. Any kind of oddball plane that was going over the Sioux Locks at that time was shot down, which they didn't have any incidents, but that was made for that. They also put up barrage balloons all around the Sioux Locks. They were 30 feet long. They looked like dirigibles, and they were on steel cables anchored deep into the ground. So if a dive bomber was going to go in, they figured the Germans would be ones that would try to dive bomb it. So if they would go in, they'd get tangled up in the cables, the steel cables that these dirigibles were tied to. They also had a mesh, heavy-duty screen underwater to catch any submarines that might come through. They also were worried about boats being sabotaged in the locks. And my grandfather, he was a captain at that time, and all the officers on the lake freighters were required to carry firearms in case somebody tried to get on the boat, either through you know some other method or they just hopped aboard while it was in dock and then tried to sabotage it. They were authorized to shoot on sight somebody that was strange on their vessels. At one point, 12,000 troops were stationed in Sault Ste. Marie. I guess the locks were pretty critical to the economy and to wartime production. I mean, they're still pretty critical to the economy today too, right? The Sioux locks in the Great Lakes shipping industry are often described as the linchpin of the Great Lakes navigation system. And certainly for the upper lakes, that is true. Currently, 100% of our domestic iron ore supply is coming on boats through the Sioux locks. The only places in the U.S. we are presently mining iron ore are in the western UP of Michigan and the Mesabi Range in northern Minnesota. And all of that ore that is going to steel mills on the lower lakes has to be loaded onto boats and carried through the Sioux locks. Yeah, they're building a new lock now because currently only one lock, the Po, can handle the big thousand foot freighters. The current Po lock were to ever go down for any length of time, it would cripple the economy because traffic would probably grind to a stop very quickly. And uh, then the auto industry would, would tank, the steel industry would tank, and there'd be a lot of difficulty getting grain down to the markets on the lower lakes and to the world. It would be uh, just a disaster if the uh, pole went down. These guests on the boat were obviously excited to go through the Sioux Locks. You know, I think as a passenger, it is a really kind of one of the interesting, fun high points of the trip. And one of the kind of interesting things is you can feel the boat rising and falling. It's kind of like when you're in an elevator. You can feel internally that change in elevation. And that's uh, kind of a fun thing, which is the reason people pay to take tours. During this section of the footage, while they're still at the Sioux Locks, the camera pans over and we see another freighter called the Horace S. Wilkinson. Why do you think he shot that? The Wilkinson was a fleet mate of the Smith Thompson. And it looks like maybe there are some greetings being exchanged between the two captains. They're yelling or they're waving or something like that which was very common back in those days. I want to break in and show you something I didn't know about when I talked to these experts. In this shot, we see three passengers walking on deck. The woman on the left has a magazine, and on the back of that magazine is a full-page ad for Chesterfield cigarettes. Chesterfield ran a different ad every month. This is the ad that we see in the film, and it's from August 1937. So we know the film is after that but before 1939, because there are no troops at the Sioux Locks. Okay, back to the conversation. Well, leaving the Sioux Locks, we know they didn't go west to Lake Michigan. They came down through Lake Huron, through the St. Clair River, 
through Lake St. Clair and on to the next place we see, which is the Detroit River. You can see the Ambassador Bridge in the distance, which was completed in 1929. When they panned the city, you could actually see a building called the Penobscot Building. And my grandfather, before they built the bridge, he said he was sailing back before they built the Ambassador Bridge. He said they always could tell when they were coming into Detroit because the Penobscot Building, which was the tallest building at the time, had an antenna on top and it had a huge red lighted ball on top of it. And you could always tell when you were getting close to Detroit, they look out for the red ball on the Penobscot Building. Yeah, that's right. When the Penobscot Building was finished, it was the eighth tallest building in the world and the tallest in America outside of New York and Chicago. They've recently restored that red orb on top. We also see the ferries, the Detroit River passenger ferries uh, were ubiquitous on the Detroit River back and forth between Detroit and Windsor. A lot of people lived in Detroit and worked in Windsor or vice versa. And so those vessels were running every 15 or 20 minutes and they stopped running in 1938. Okay, so we know this film had to be shot before the end of the 1938 shipping season, which came on December 16th. What else can you tell us about Detroit during that time? Detroit was the automotive hub of the country and of the world. And Henry Ford had built his River Rouge plant and they were turning out cars with the iron ore that was brought in on the freighters and the coal and the limestone that was brought in on the freighters to make steel. That was a bustling area. So do you think Detroit was the destination or do you think it was somewhere else further south? Our best guess is that is Conneaut, Ohio. Uh, and it's the uh, Pittsburgh and Conneaut Dock Company facility there. Uh, just judging by the setup and the number of unloaders. Yeah, what are those things we're seeing? Because those machines are crazy. What you're seeing there is called Hewlett Unloaders. It's spelled the exact same way as my last name. Hewlett Unloaders is where a person sat inside of the actual steam shovel that went down into the boat and jawed up a whole lot of iron ore. And then they maneuvered that jaw back out, up and over and dropped it into rail cars. Oh, wow. Hewlett Unloaders were invented in County Ohio in 1898 and they made it much faster and cheaper to unload ore, and some of them were still in use into the 1990s. I can't believe there's a guy in there running those big jaws. Those guys were the privileged lot. Uh, that's, that was really a skilled job because they had to line those things up and not smash the hatch combings around where the shovel entered into the boat. Uh, so those guys were really very skilled operators. The next shot features three well-dressed women on a much smaller boat. It would have taken a while to unload this freighter, and it looks like these women decided they wanted some shore leave. And the women maybe just want to get off and go shopping, or go see a local site, or do something to get off the ship for a while. They've probably been on five, six, seven days, five, six days maybe at this point, and they're looking to stretch their legs, see a little bit of the ground. It is also possible that they are departing the ship at this point, but if you look, it doesn't really seem to be any baggage on the tugboat. There are some totes and stuff in front of the wheelhouse. I, I would imagine that they were also delivering supplies to the vessel at the same time while they're taking these women to go spend their day doing whatever and hopefully towards the end of the day they get back on board again. But there's also some milk containers probably that might need to get exchanged. So they're getting off and they're in Conneaut and getting ready to uh, send the ship back up to Lake Superior for more ore. After unloading in Conneaut, the next thing we see is the Sioux Locks again. So it looks like they're making a round trip because they've turned back north, sailed through Lake Huron, and they're heading back into Lake Superior. I would say the route of the ship was, was pretty simple and it probably did it many times over and again. And there's the aerial lift bridge, the gateway to Duluth Harbor. We didn't see it as they left Duluth, but it's in the shot at the end. So they've completed their run from Lake Superior to Lake Erie and back. Thank you so much for your help in figuring out this film. I really hope our viewers have more information for us, like who shot the film and who we're seeing on screen. At Great Lakes Now, we aim to cover the Great Lakes region and the people who live here, like you. Please follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for our newsletter at greatlakesnow.org.